Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I am Jane Allman, the pastor here at uh, Glendale Heights United Methodist Church, and I extend a welcome to everyone here this morning, as well as those who are watching on Facebook, either in real time or tuning in later on. Um, would just like to remind you today that next Sunday we'll have a guest preacher, uh, Reverend Dr. Elaine Heath. Uh, he's the founder of uh, the church at Spring Forest over there in Hillsboro, my, my other, my extension appointment. Um, she and some folks from the farm will be here, and uh, she'll be bringing us the message, and they'll also be sharing with you a little bit about uh, what all's going on over at um, the farm at, at Spring Forest um, with the church and um, with the garden and the various ministries that we're, we're trying to develop. So I hope that'll be uh, an uplifting time for y'all. Um, we, as of last week, we were, um, you know, Durham was put under emergency orders and um, we we're again asked to wear a mask indoors uh, wherever we go, um, or required to wear a mask indoors wherever we go, businesses and all. And uh, Amy and I are, we're talking this morning about the news that came out over the weekend. Uh, um, some updated guidance for faith communities. So uh, we probably need to get a trustees meeting together this week and um, talk about how we're going to go forward here, whether we need to uh, consider moving back outside or just going virtual again. Um, I don't know if y'all saw where even a group that was meeting outdoors with masks on, um, they only took their mask off to, to eat, um, there was a, a spread of the Delta variant amongst that, that group of, I think, pharmacy students at UNC. Um, so we, we need to take a hard look at the numbers. Um, transmission rate is up above 5%, and this Delta variant is um, attacking young people, putting young people in the hospital, so we, we just need to pay attention. And um, we'll discuss all the details uh, this week, hopefully, get the trustees together and um, we'll let you know if anything changes before next Sunday. So invite your uh, prayers around all that as well. Are there any other announcements that I need to mention? Okay, then I invite you to consider yourselves in this time and in this place. Um, try to empty your heads of distracting thoughts and open your hearts um, to receive Jesus, as we listen to the opening prelude. I invite you to join with me in the call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. We'll read responsibly. Wisdom invites us to come and feast at the banquet. Come and dine with wisdom. Eat the bread and drink the wine. Go 
And let us now join together in our hymn of praise, Freely, Freely, on page 389 in your hymnals. blessed to have a God who hears our prayers and answers them. And so we uh, come before God and one another now with our joys and our celebrations. Um, I would um, celebrate the, the work that the Duke students did this week. I don't know if you all are, are aware, but they cut a nature trail through our little uh, patch of woods there at the edge of the parking lot. And you can uh, enter at one corner of the parking lot and it'll just take you around to the other corner. They set up um, little stumps, uh, pieces of logs there to, to show the entrance. And it's just a short little path, but it's all, you know, first through uh, or one, one to five-year-old's need um, to get back there and, and see a little bit of God's creation. So um, just so thankful for the partnership that we have with the Durham Community Preschool and uh, look forward to um, increasing and deepening our friendship with them in the days to come. Um, heard just now that uh, Jean Lorenzo has fallen and broken her hip and is uh, at Duke Regional. And um, Doris Hodges is under lockdown at uh, the facility where, where she is, um, Carver, Carver Living, something like that. Um, I guess there's an outbreak of, of the, the virus there. So very sad to hear both of those things and uh, we wanna keep them in our prayers this morning. Um, other joys or concerns that you would lift up? I'm saying a concern to see as well. <coughs> Joe Bay's boy has been moved to the group of our sister living facility. And I've got no alcohol in the nation. All we want is bad days. I'll be glad to stay and I'll try to leave to the office. Okay, Joe Baysmore? Joe Bazemore is in assisted living now. Other joys or concerns? Robin? Well, this week turned out to be very rocky for Steve. However, ending on a God night, he got up this morning, he walked, he was already walked 100 feet, so he's headed in the right direction. Thanks be to God. It's, it's Steve is um, back on the upswing after a rough week. 
Um, we want to remember this morning our brothers and sisters in Haiti. Um, I know, have any of y'all been on mission to Haiti? Um, I was able to go um, when I was in seminary. The bishop took us, and uh, one of my classmates was from Haiti, and she and her sister were uh, trying to develop a, a ministry there for women uh, to teach them some farming techniques and help to make them independent. Um, that was some years ago. I don't know uh, what, what became of that ministry, but um, the United Methodists have, a lot of United Methodists have been to Haiti over the years and um, have f deep friendships down there. So um, we want to hold the people of Haiti in our prayers after the, the earthquake um, a couple of days ago. And of course, uh, we want to lift up the situation in Afghanistan as well. And um, uh, just and pray that the peace will come to that country one way or the other and that, that we could somehow be part of um, that peace and um, more than likely we'll be receiving um, refugees from that situation in this country maybe even right here in Durham and um, I hope that we can be ready to receive them um, in whatever ways we can I'd also like to lift up my colleague and our neighbor in ministry, Reverend Casey Merston over at um, St. Paul and Duke's Chapel. Uh, she went in for a surgery and um, laparoscopic surgery, and once they got in, they found out they couldn't complete the surgery laparoscopically, so she um, has to wait for relief until uh, sometime in September. Uh, for regular surgery so uh, she's in a bit of pain so we we pray for her um, as she uh, awaits uh, surgery that will uh, take care of her problem we're, we're grateful that Emily's doing well enough to be up in the mountains uh, this weekend with Sid so she's uh, recovered uh, Leonard Okay, so prayers for Remy on her uh, surgery tomorrow. Oh, if there are no other joys or concerns that you would share, then let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we are gathered here this morning for many reasons of our own, but we also come because you've called us to be here. We've come to see each other, to hear some music, to be comforted by a prayer, to be inspired by your word. You have called us here to be shaped into your people who bear witness to you. Having called us to be your people, you do feed us and strengthen us with your very self, abiding in us so that we may abide in you. Grant that we may be broken bread and poured out wine for others as Christ is for us. And as we seek to be for others, as Christ is for us, we offer up our prayers this morning. We pray for those who are sick, for, for Casey and for Jean and uh, for Steve. And we pray for uh, Remy as she goes in for her surgery tomorrow and pray that you would surround her with your love and care and that she would feel your presence and be comforted and uh, not experience any fear and uh, strengthen her family as well as they support her. We uh, pray for the situation at um, uh, Doris Hodges's, Hodges' living facility that uh, they would be able to contain the virus. And um, we ask that you'd be with Joe as he adjusts to uh, new life in an assisted living facility. And we pray that you would guide um, Jean's doctors and um, so that her recovery from her hip surgery would go well. Our hearts are broken for our friends in Haiti and for our friends in Afghanistan uh, in their different situations. Um, but we pray that everything that they need to find peace, to be returned to wholeness of body, mind, and spirit would come their way. And we continue to pray for our, our ministry partners, um, the NA groups that meet here, 
Durham Community Preschool, um, uh, our, our friends across the street at Brogdon Middle School. And um, I pray that our relationships would strengthen and deepen and that we would find ways to support each other in our respective ministries and areas of action. We remember uh, also Doug Rue this morning who did have his eye surgery on Monday and uh, pray that his recovery goes well and that he is relieved of pain and will be returned to wholeness of body, mind, and spirit. Dear God, remind us over and over again that your power is sufficient for all the needs that we bring to you and remind us that you do handle each and every one of them with love and care. Help us to place our trust and our confidence in you. And we thank you for your son Jesus who has given us the best example of what it means to truly serve you and witness to your love and encourage us to serve you more fully. And we pray now as Jesus taught us to pray with him, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning as we continue in the sixth chapter of John um, it comes from verses 51 through 58. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's a, a Native American parable 
that's fairly well known, and I would like to share it with you this morning. There was a, a little boy uh, who was having a hard time with one of his um, playmates. They had gotten into a, a fight of some sort, and he goes running to his grandfather. And the grandfather says, well, let me tell you a story. Sometimes I also have felt great hate for those who have taken something from me and they have no sorrow for what they do. But hate wears you down and does not hurt your enemy. It's like taking poison and expecting your enemy to die. I've struggled with these feelings many times. And the grandfather goes on. It's as if there are two wolves inside of me. One is good and does no harm. He lives in harmony with all around him and does not take offense when no offense was intended. He will fight only when it's right to do so and in the right way. But the other wolf, he is full of anger. The littlest thing will send him into a fit of temper. He fights everyone all the time for no reason. He cannot think because his anger and hate are so great. It's hard to live with these two wolves inside me, for both of them try to dominate my spirit. And the little boy asks, which one wins, grandfather? And the grandfather said, the one I feed. That's sort of like what's going on in our gospel lesson for today. You remember that Jesus is in the synagogue at Capernaum, and he's speaking to the crowd that went looking for him after he fed fed them with the five loaves and the two fish on the other side of the sea. And he's been speaking for a while now about himself being the bread from heaven. And the folks were already grumbling, first challenging Jesus to show them a sign so they could believe what he was saying. And as Jesus continued to repeat that he's the bread of heaven that gives life to the world, they grumble even more, wondering how the man that they know to be the son of Mary and Joseph can be saying, I have come down from heaven. And up until this point, the crowd is still thinking that Jesus is just telling them that he can provide them with the actual bread to eat whenever they need it or want it. And at first, he uses words that in the original language are more symbolic and they're kind of poetic when he's talking about himself as the bread of life. But as the folks continue to grumble and to press him for explanations, Jesus gets very specific and very realistic. He makes this really bold statement that we just heard in the scripture. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And he says it several times in several different ways. I think I, think I counted the, the verb eat and, flet and the word flesh like six to eight times in these, in these eight verses. And he says it in the positive, and then he says it in the negative, and then he goes back to the positive. And he calls life different things. You will live, you will have life, you will have eternal life. He is really hammering on this, this concept. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Well, now, some of the crowd are really buzzing. They're wondering, is Jesus telling us to be cannibals? Some of these... Some of, some of the people hearing these words are probably horrified not only at this image of cannibalism, but the implied violation of their food laws. This talk of drinking blood goes against one of the fundamental taboos of the food laws of Israel, and that's drinking blood or eating meat that has not been properly drained of blood. But we have to realize that that Jesus is talking to a group of people who find themselves caught in between their allegiance to their Jewish heritage and the old covenants and laws and the teachings of this Jesus who presents himself as a new covenant, whose flesh and blood must be consumed in order to have eternal life. And where God once kept his covenant by raining down manna from heaven to give life to the children of Israel, God now makes a new covenant by offering his very son and to, to, to give them eternal life. Now some of those gathered there understand what Jesus is saying and some are immediately horrified and leave, failing to see the connection between the old and the new. And they see only something new and different, something threatening and offensive. It's like within that crowd 
are those two wolves from the story. The wolf that takes offense at everything around him and the wolf that lives in harmony with everything. Now before we get too judgy, let's put ourselves in the place of the children of Israel. And above all, let's not do what uh, so many of our brothers and sisters in Christ have done throughout the ages and use the book of John to demonize the Jewish people, uh, to misinterpret um, the translation, uh, the way that, that, that this book has been translated over the years. It makes it sound like the Jews are um, to be demonized. Um, let's not hear it that way. We, we have things to learn um, from, from this from this passage and from what happens here. Um, what's going on here is that the children of Israel are much more used to a transcendent God. And they're used to a God who is up there while they're down here struggling to follow all the rules that they thought would make them acceptable in God's sight. The folks gathered there with Jesus have been living for generations under the laws that were handed down to Moses not just the Ten Commandments, but those 600 and some additional instructions that God spelled out for Moses and that were recorded in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. And these are very specific instructions about how to live in a way that would set them apart as God's chosen people and remind them of their dependence on God and his covenant with them to be their God. God didn't hand out these laws arbitrarily just to try and trip people up and to be able to say you're in and you're out. It was nothing like that. It was simply to impress upon them that there, there was one God, not all these other gods, these Baals and the golden calves that they were out there worshiping. He was trying to impress upon them that he was the one God and that these were ways that they were to set themselves apart and to remind themselves that he was the one God and he had called them to be his people. They, they had become used to living in a world that, that over time had come to be interpreted as a world of boundaries, of clear lines drawn between clean and unclean, and holy and unholy, and insider and outsider. Don't we always get into trouble when we take things to the extreme? They're used to a God who could only be approached by specific people, by the priest in very specific ways, in very specific places, and, and at very specific times. The priest, even the priest, could only approach the altar in the temple after elaborate purification rituals. And then here comes Jesus. He's not even a priest. He's a carpenter, and he's claiming to be God in their midst. And, and he's inviting them to be so intimate with him as to mingle his flesh and blood with theirs. The God that is up there is now revealing himself to be down here, to be present in this world, to be indwelling in us, to exist within us in the form of an ordinary carpenter. This Jesus as God throws out the cleanliness laws even as he speaks of eating flesh and drinking blood. He blurs those lines between up there and down here, between us and them. And this is a new thing for this crowd, and it's pretty unsettling. But Jesus rarely speaks, rarely speaks, without grounding his remarks in the tradition in which he was raised. As he said, he came not to abolish, but to fulfill. So he's always doing a new thing in light of an old thing. So by, by likening himself to the bread of heaven, Jesus is establishing a link between old covenants of God with the children of Israel and the new covenant, the incarnation of the word in Jesus Christ who became flesh and dwells among us. So Jesus stands in the line of tradition of God's gracious provision while offering himself as the new covenant, that new bread of salvation. He's not negating tradition, he's building on it. He's saying yes and instead of yes but. He's saying yes there is tradition, and there's a new way of living out their tradition. He's not saying, yes, there's tradition, but it's got to go. By eating, 
the flesh and drinking the blood of Jesus so that we abide in him, we become what he is, the presence of God in this world. And we can also begin to live without boundaries, not separated from the world, not shut off in our own little Christian bubble, but moving in the world and fully integrated with it. Now, I'll grant you, it's a scary proposition to be invited to transform tradition and become intimate with God and one another. And as we enter into ministry together, I may say things or suggest things or invite you to do things that push the boundaries of your comfort zone. And I may have already done that, for all I know. Likewise, you may push the boundaries of my comfort zone. And you have already done that by making me be live streamed. But I will never intentionally scare you or stomp on your traditions or negate your story. I will try not to say, yes, but. Yes, you are doing this, but it is wrong. I will be trying to say, yes, you're doing this, and we can build on it in new ways. And I hope that we can receive all these new things as invitations and not as threats. And I hope that we can receive new things as invitations to feed on Jesus and become more and more like him and be strengthened to grow our community here in ways that increasingly reflect the kingdom of God. We have some big challenges in front of us here at Glendale Heights, but there are also big opportunities. And so we're going to be having some conversations about these new things. And it's going to push the boundaries of our comfort zones, no doubt. I'm already shaking in my boots just thinking about these conversations. It's scary and challenging to do new things. And if we're putting Jesus in our bodies, as we talked about last week through this means of grace, then we're taking in the very substance that we need for strengthening us to love God with all our heart and our neighbors as ourselves. The grandfather in the story at the beginning knew he had a choice about which wolf to feed, the one that grumbles and takes offense and stirs up trouble and negativity, or the one that's good and that lives in harmony and that doesn't take offense. We also have a choice. In the days ahead, are we going to feed the wolf that reacts out of fear and that takes offense and that sees new things as threatening, or are we going to feed the good wolf and make faithful and fruitful connections between the old and the new, taking no offense and living in harmony with all that is around us. May we feed the good wolf with the flesh of Jesus, that part of Jesus that abides in us when we feed on him and incorporating his will and his ways into our very selves until we become one with him and one in ministry with all the world. May it be so. Amen. And last week, I was encouraged to do a new thing, shake it up just a little bit, and uh, read um, or recite this morning instead of the, the usual Apostles' Creed to um, try one of the other creeds in the back of the hymnal there um, that we affirm as United Methodist. So I invite you to turn in your hymnals to uh, number 883 and let us join together in this statement of faith from the United Church of Canada. Let's uh, read in unison. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, 
God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And we are grateful for those words from our sister church in Canada that um, open up um, our affirmation of faith in, in new ways and shed new light on it. And just as we respond with words, our words to the word of God, uh, we also respond as Jesus did by offering our, our very flesh. So we're called to offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice and to return to God that which was first given to us. And um, this would be the time in the service that we would normally pass the plates, but we're not because of uh, safety concerns. But I um, do invite you, if you haven't already, to uh, drop your offering in the plate that's out there in the entrance way. And for those who are, are watching from home, um, we invite you to uh, mail in a contribution if you feel so led. And at this time, we would like to offer a prayer over all the gifts that we uh, give to God this day, um, both from our material resources and the gifts of ourselves that we give. So let us pray. Holy God, what we offer to you this morning is but a token of what you are due. Make us ever more generous and remind us that if we invest wisely in things that help usher in your kingdom of love and compassion, we will never be found wanting. We pray in the name of the Christ who held nothing back, not even his flesh and blood. Amen. And as we prepare to go forth into this world, I invite you to join together in the hymn of dedication, Take Time to Be Holy, number 395, and we'll sing verses 1 and 4. Brothers and sisters, remember those two wolves that live inside and consider which one you want to feed. As you go forth into the world this week, go in peace with the love of God, with the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>